The comedic icon Harold Ramis died a little less than two years ago at the far too young an age of 69. My introduction to Ramis was in the 80s through his role as Dr. Egon Spingler uh, in the two Ghostbuster movies, which he also co-wrote. He's also fondly remembered by many as the writer-director of 1980's Caddyshack, 1983's National Lampoon's Vacation, uh, 1993's Groundhog Day, and perhaps slightly less fondly for the OK 1999, Analyze This, followed by Analyze That. Because he didn't really peak at the end of his career, most critics would say that his comedic masterpiece was arguably Groundhog's Day. Starring Bill Murray and Andy McDowell, Groundhog Day is the sixth and final collaboration between Ramis and Murray. Any fans of Groundhog Day out there? All right, very good. That helps that at least a few of you have seen the movie. Uh, one definition of what makes a film, a book, a song, uh, or any piece of art really a classic is that it continues to be a source of wisdom with offering new insights with each repeated encounter. So on this morning, two years, two, two years, two days before uh, Groundhog Day, I'd like to invite us to revisit Harold Ramis's classic film to see what wisdom there might still be in it for us today. Uh, the movie opens on February 1st, you know, which we all call Groundhog Day Eve, right? We eagerly anticipate it each year, all small children everywhere around the world. So Groundhog Day Eve, Bill Murray's character, this local TV meteorologist, Phil Connors, is standing in front of a weather map and saying, somebody asked me today, Phil, if you could be anywhere in the world, where would you be? And I said to him, probably right here in Elko, Nevada. The, our nation's high at 79 degrees today. And there and in the scenes to follow, you can hear Phil's discontent with his life. And after that night's broadcast, he's obligated to make the 90-minute trip from Philadelphia, where he's that local TV weatherman, to Puxatani, PA, for his fourth year in a row covering the annual Groundhog Day festivities, an assignment that he views as unworthy of his immense talent. <laughs> Now, I should mention that 2016, this Tuesday, will be the 130th anniversary of the first Groundhog Day. Uh, has anyone ever been to the annual Groundhog Day Festival in Puxatani? All right, I've never actually met someone who's been, but uh, <laughs> uh, if you do go, let me know. It's only about three hours from here, uh, and if you do go, be forewarned that if you've also seen the film, the film wasn't actually filmed, ironically, in Puxatani, Pennsylvania. It was filmed in Woodstock, Illinois, because the town square in Woodstock, Illinois is what Hollywood feels like Puxatani should look like. <laughs> look up simulacrum in the dictionary later. Um, the premise of the film is that Phil gets trapped in this time loop, and the origins of, and the rules of the time loop are, I think, wisely never explained um, by the film. But the upshot is that no matter what Phil does, he wakes up every day, and it is yet again 6 o'clock a.m. on February 2nd, 1993. You might remember what they were doing on February 2nd, 1993? Uh, Groundhog Day. For everyone else, it's as if they are living February 2nd for the first time. But for Phil, the number of times he's lived through this particular February 2nd just keeps stacking up. On day one, when the time loop hasn't started, Phil's narcissism is on full display in his sarcastic treatment of everyone that he meets. When the owner of the bed and breakfast asks him, will you be checking out today? He replies snidely, chance of departure today, 100%. But when Phil wakes up on day two and begins to realize slowly and surreally that it is still Groundhog's Day, the first cracks in his ego begin to show. This time, he nervously responds to the B&B owner, slightly unsettled. Uh, chance of departure, 80%, 75-80. Uh, Phil is having what is sometimes called a train wreck event, in which one's worldview is suddenly and irrevocably challenged. I suspect you may be able to think of parallels in your own life or in the lives of people that you love. 
On day three, one of the many signs that Phil, like the rest of us, is a pretty slow learner. And sometimes we're a, we're a fast learner in some areas of our life, and we're a slow learner in other areas of our life. One of the signs of that for Phil is that he accidentally steps for the third day in a row in a huge puddle as he steps off the sidewalk, the same puddle that he stepped in the previous two days. Feeling demoralized, Phil begins to despair, and that night, while attempting to drown his sorrows in a local bowling alley bar, Phil says, You know, I was in the Virgin Islands once. I met a girl. We ate lobster and drank pina coladas. At sunset, we made love like sea otters. That was a pretty good day. Why couldn't I get that day over and over and over? Because it's easy to be your best self on the beach, but the challenge is everyday life. And suddenly Phil realizes, wait, if there's no tomorrow, there's no consequences. And thus begins a series of hedonistic hijack, hijack, hijinks that, uh, but eventually, that I will not fully detail, but uh, Phil eventually tires of even these adolescent pursuits and even the most outrageous options begin to seem monotonous because he's done them all time and time again. So Phil's postmodern Pilgrim's progress continues through a few more stages. He tries both killing himself even a few different ways, as well as taking, he kidnaps the famous groundhog, Phil, you know, Patoxy, uh, uh, Patoxy Phil uh, and sees maybe that critter is the source of this time warp, so he tries taking the groundhog day with him, but it turns out the groundhog is not the source of his travails either. Every time he just wakes up in the same bed, in the same room, and the world has reset itself yet again to 6 a.m. on February 2nd, 1993. Eventually, Phil begins a prolonged pursuit of self-improvement. He starts practicing generosity. He gives money to the homeless man that he's passed every morning for years at that point that he's ignored on so many previous versions of that day. He starts reading books and taking piano lessons and learning French and even learning to ice sculpt. Admittedly, these pursuits are at first a cynical attempt to win the affections of Phil's producer, Rita, played by Annie McDowell, trying to create, force some semblance of that day on the beach to, to happen. But it turns out it is Phil who has changed in the process. And perhaps the most profound part of the film, Phil comes to, befit, to befriend that homeless man that I mentioned earlier, only to discover devastatingly that even with unlimited time and chances, he's unable to save that homeless man's life. Phil tries countless times of how he approaches the day and every possible medical intervention, but each one results in him being at the bedside of that man as he passes away. He's never able to do that, to change that one thing. Because there is a limit to whom we can save and to what any of us can accomplish in the finite time that we have on this earth. Ultimately, though, Groundhog Day is a comedy and not a tragedy, and when Phil stops trying so hard to impress Rita and lets her experience for herself, the person that he has become, he is able to break out of his old habitual ways of being in the world, and this time he wakes up in the morning, and at long last, it is February 3rd. So how long was Phil stuck in that time loop? You can go way down the internet wormhole trying to figure that out. Uh, you know, how long did it take him to learn the lessons that he needed? Well, the film actually doesn't say explicitly, but Ramus's own ex uh, estimation from the clues in the film is that it's something like 30 or 40 years. 30 or 40 years. That's about 10,000 to 15,000 Groundhog Days in a row. And on one hand, that feels like a lot. And on the other hand, as someone who's in his late 30s, there are lessons that has taken me close to 40 years to learn, and there are many lessons that I have yet to master. Can some of you perhaps relate, or you've got it all sorted out, right? Uh, now, what were the life lessons that you just didn't learn until your 20s, until your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, and beyond? 
What lessons do you wish the people in your life would learn in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, and beyond? Now, there are many possible lenses through which to view this film and correspondingly our own lives. One from the 19th century Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard is to see Phil as progressing through the stages of the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Phil's early adolescent rebellion of no consequences um, feels, epitomizes the hedonistic stage of the aesthetic, the aesthete who cares only about his or her own pleasure. And those self-improvement regimes, which really have a lot of positive results, they culminate, though, in facing your mortality, the limitations on what, on what any of us can do to improve ourselves or to help others. That's a classic example of Kierkegaard's ethical stage. Finally, Phil passes into the religious stage, which in this case, in many ways, is Taoist. Only when he stops pursuing his love interest so selfishly, so cynically, and so forcefully, and instead simply is his natural evolving self, is he able to authentically connect with the, human, the other human being in front of him. Related to Taoism, there are many significant Buddhist themes in the film, which isn't surprising since Harold Ramis is married to a Buddhist and calls himself, while not fully Buddhist, at least Buddhish. <laughs> um, and fascinatingly, as detailed in the interview, many interviews on the DVD special features, uh, spiritual communities ranging from Hasidic Jews to the yoga community all responded enthusiastically to this film and wrote to Ramus saying how they were so grateful for him writing a movie that was so in line with their particular, you know, theology or philosophy, and like, oh, they all thought that. Many people in the therapeutic community also saw connections, that the repetition of Groundhog Day can be seen as a perfect metaphor for psychoanalysis, to keep revisiting the same material with increasing insight. Along those lines, remember how the film began. It's Groundhog Day Eve, and Bill Murray's character is standing in front of that weather map. Phil, if you could be anywhere in the world, well, certainly he didn't answer right here, right in this present moment in place. No, he said, well, probably it'd be Elko, Nevada, our nation's high at 79 today. And no doubt at that point in his life, it would have been maybe a different answer for every day, depending on the mercurial weather. But after spending 30 to 40 years worth of time in Groundhog Days in Punxsutawney, PA, where he was dreading spending even one day, when he finally wakes up, and it's the day after uh, Groundhog Day, but he's still in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, he turns to Rita and says, Today is tomorrow. Let's live here. We'll rent to start. As the proverb says, wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, if you are working through your karma, your emotional baggage, if you will, then you'll likely find yourself slipping back into old habitual patterns that just create further suffering for yourself and those around you, whether you're in Pittsburgh or in you know, Elko, Nevada, or on that beach sipping pina coladas or in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. But there are ways of increasingly escaping narcissism, self-involvement, and of increasingly connecting with others around us and the world. There are many different paths to getting there, from Buddhist to pagan, from humanist to Muslim, from Jewish to Christian, and we have various groups here at UUCF that can help you with going deeper on those paths. Regardless of your choice, it does take commitment and work. It may take 30 or 40 or more years. Relatedly, part of what is fascinating about the thought experiment that is the film Groundhog Day is that only Phil changes. Everyone else is the same, but as Phil changes his piece of the puzzle, there are ripple effects everywhere. We can't change everyone, but the film invites us to ask whether we're changing that which is in our control, starting with the way that we are in the world and how we treat other people. 
Finally, it's no coincidence that the film is set on Groundhog Day. As Scott alluded to earlier, Groundhog Day coming up this Tuesday, it's our secular version in the U.S. of that ancient, pagan, earth-centered tradition called Imbolc. The day precisely halfway between winter solstice, that darkest, longest night of the year, and spring equinox, that day that's uh, equal parts light and dark, that first day of spring. Groundhog Day plays with that turning point on the wheel of the year with the question of whether Punxsutawney Phil will see his shadow. In the film, Bill Murray's everyman meteorologist, also named Phil, right, just like the groundhog, is faced metaphorically with that same question. On Groundhog Day, on in bulk, will he, will we, turn toward our shadow, our unconscious, habitual ways of being in the world? Is that what we will turn toward? Or will we choose to live a more intentional, conscious life, making those unconscious patterns increasingly conscious that gives us a little distance from them and a little options to respond and not just react to everything around us. Regardless of what others around you are doing in your life right now, are you ready to change your piece of the puzzle? As we move toward that midpoint between winter and spring, what would it look like in your life to move incrementally toward more kindness, toward more generosity, more toward connection instead of isolation? What might such a choice unlock for you in the days, in the weeks, and in the years to come? For now, as I move toward my conclusion, I invite you to hear a poem titled Before I Knew to Look by the singer-songwriter Carrie Newcomer. Newcomer writes, how often it is the fine detail, a small thing, that snaps me back into the here and now, amber light coming through the trees, the slippery soft sound of creek water running beneath a tender filigree of ice, my impossibly happy dog rolling in the fresh snow, the give and chop of a carrot, on the cutting board, luxurious as sleep and as rich as drinking cream, the image of two grown men wiping tears of laughter from the crinkled edges of their eyes. It is as easy to be lost as it is hard to be lost. But I am growing bored with tomorrow. What will be and how I will be then, of worried speculation and detached dreaming, Phantoms only. The flip side of creative imagining. I am happiest these days when yesterday is an old friend with whom I share much history, and tomorrow is willing to wait for its own time above the horizon line. I am most content when I find my own life right here, in the bowl of my cupped hands, and sense that that hollow place is actually filled with light, light that was already there before I knew to look. We continue to reflect on these things and where we find ourselves, what turning points we may knowingly or unknowingly be in the midst of in this particular season of our life. I invite you to turn in your hymnal to hymn 83 and let's sing together, rise and body your spirit, winds be still. Mm -hmm. 